Just so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Walter Edwards. I'm the director of the Humanity Center, and I wish to welcome you to this final um, episode of the uh, Humanity Center Brung Bahak series this year. And it couldn't have um, ended in a better note for me intellectually or academically because um, the, the talk is, is coming from a, from a linguist and my discipline is linguistics. She's a member of the, of the linguistics program here at Wayne State University and I, I am part of that, uh, a part of that group. And so we are ending um, on a good note and her topic is very dear to my heart about the importance of linguistic diversity as uh, uh, both and um, globally. And so it is uh, very, I'm very pleased to, to welcome her to the podium. And um, last week we had another linguist, um, uh, Steve Chris O'Malley um, uh, give a talk and uh, that was very well received. And um, at the beginning of the new academic year, we're likely to have um, Liliana Provogak, uh, who is a distinguished linguist in our in our program, she will be. She is. Um, she signed up for our for our Brumbach series, but um, mainly because she's also the recipient of our Marlin Williamson Distinguished Faculty Fellowship Award, and because um, her talk uh, for that award was uh, scheduled to be in January, and we couldn't 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 have it then she's going to have it in the in the fall so um good so the the program is surrounded by by linguists thank you and are you in the presence of uh, an outstanding uh, scholar in her own right um natalia racklin is an associate professor of english and linguistics here at wayne specializing in language acquisition and language disorders her research aims at identifying universal and language specific patterns of language acquisition in, tip, in typically developing children and children with developmental language disorders. She's also interested in the relationship between the acquisition of syntax and cognitive and advancement in early childhood. She's also interested in neurobiological substrates of individual differences in language development. So she is um, interested in a wide variety of topics within a general area. Her articles have been published in such distinguished journals as Language Acquisition, Language Science, Journal of Speech Language and Hearing Research, Journal of Child Language, Pediatrics, Scientific Studies of Reading, International Journal of Communication Disorders, and Annals of Dyslexia. I'm not um, going to read uh, specific uh, examples of her work, uh, but just to say that her talk today will be on global linguistic diversity, common myths and dark realities. So it is with great pleasure, I welcome to the virtual podium Professor Natalia Racklin. Thank you so much, Walter, for, for the introduction. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you, the Humanity Center, for this opportunity, and Kennedy for all the help with organizing. Mm -hmm. And of course, thank you, everybody, for being so generous with your time. And I know it's the end of the semester, and there is so much going on. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say that when I first um, sent the, the title for this talk to to Kennedy, it had the, the title was slightly different. I had I revised it, so my original title was "Global Linguistic Diversity: um, Something About uh, tra Tragedy and Hope." The tragedy and hope, and then um, so I sent the talk, and when I was working on the talk, by the end of the before I finished um, putting it together, I realized that unfortunately I don't really have a lot of hopeful things to say, so I changed it, and it's. <laughs> So at the end, maybe um, some of you could um, 
add something hopeful about the fate of linguistic diversity. Um, I also, before I start, want to say that this is a topic that um, is different from what I usually work on, because as Walter said, I um, study child language acquisition, so I consider myself a uh, developmental psycholinguist. And in my other work, well, uh, basically all the work that I have done, um, the unit of analysis is, is an individual, an individual mind. And this is very different. Uh, here I'm looking at uh, countries, societies, and um, this is a departure for me. And I'm doing it because I've been, for the last two semesters, I've been teaching a course um, called Languages of the World. And um, so having that opportunity to teach that course and in my conversation with the students and reading for the course, this is, so I will be presenting the thoughts that um, I had as a result of that experience. So first, just a few preliminaries um, about the state of linguistic diversity today. So this is a map from um, the Ethnologue, um, SIL International, that shows that um, in, as of 2021, um, there are 7,139 languages uh, documented in the world. And they're spoken, there are many languages, multiple languages spoken on every continent. Siberia looks a little bit empty, but that's because it's a very large space, sparsely populated. But looking at that map, you might get an idea that there is no problem with linguistic diversity. Lots of languages are spoken, including in North America, in South America, in, in Australia, and everywhere else. However, um, if you uh, look at this map, and this map uh, shows um, levels of language diversity based on, on this um, quantitative index that was proposed by Greenberg and Ethnolog reports on um, this number for all the areas of the world. So the Greenberg's language of uh, Greenberg's index of language diversity ranges between zero and one. And um, so there are a few places in the world that have language diversity of zero. Korea, I think North Korea particularly was one like that. There is no country or place that has the index of one because what that would mean if you took randomly two random people out of the population, the index of one would indicate that they would not speak a common language. And so all the other countries range anywhere between, so anywhere in this range. And so the colors, the intensity of the color here shows the range of linguistic diversity. And you can see that it's really unevenly distributed. Even the countries uh, like the United States and Australia and Brazil that looked like on the previous map that they were populated with many different languages have relatively low um, language diversity. So for example, the US is listed with the LDL of 0.3. So, you know, on the closer to zero than to one. And um, out of the 191 um, non-immigrant languages that are listed, 84% are listed as endangered. So this, it, this index kind of captures that because it, it doesn't just simply reflect how many languages are spoken but the size of these languages proportionate to the total population. And so if almost all of the languages are small and endangered and um, it does not, it, you know, it affects the language diversity index in a way that it's, you know, makes it lower. Brazil has LDI even lower, 0.1, and 87% of, of the languages are endangered. Australia, the, the same situation, LDI of 0.3, and almost half of the languages, according to um, the, the endangerment data that I took was not from Ethnologue, but from the UNESCO Atlas of World Languages. So there might be slight discrepancy between what Ethnologue would report, but they're probably close. Russia is another country like that, um, with um, lower LDI and a large number of endangered languages. On the other hand, we have countries, um, we, we have countries like Nigeria, where language diversity index is 0.9. 
And um, so it's a very highly linguistically diverse country. There are 517 languages listed in Ethnologue for Nigeria. And only a small number, relatively small number, about 5% are listed as endangered. And uh, India is another country with really high LDI 0.9, 453 languages, another linguistic giant, um, but also a relatively high rate of language endangerment. So we can see that not only linguistic diversity is unevenly distributed, but language endangerment is an unevenly distributed. And there are some places that are very linguistically diverse and they manage to maintain that diversity and then others where um, basically almost all indigenous languages are threatened and many are already are extinct. And so this is a beautiful map um, from the Endangered Language Project that shows all of the languages that are at risk endangered um, at various stages of endangerment. And it's beautiful because it kind of shows each of the endangered languages as a light on this black background. And so gives you this idea how these lights are being extinguished and um, kind of suggesting that once they're all extinguished, everything will be just dark. But of course, that's not really the full picture because um, there is this other reality that, that is happening at the same time as all of these languages, the, you know, a high percentage of all existing languages are endangered and between 50 to 90%, depending on different people have different prognosis, but many of them will disappear. At the same time, there are some languages that are super successful. And in fact, these are, these are the top 13 languages that account for more than for over half of the world's population. So in all of these places where languages are disappearing, there are other languages that have taken over. And so you can see the list and English is number one. This includes, by the way, the, the total numbers include both first uh, speakers for whom these languages are native or first and also L2. If you only included native speakers, the, the list, it, it would be very similar, but in a different order. Mandarin Chinese would be number one and English would be number two. And so some, a few languages are taking over and um, many, many are disappearing. And in linguistics, among linguists, there is debates on uh, what to think about this situation. And um, so in my class, I, um, my, my last assignment for this class is for the students to read uh, two representative articles. One is by David Harrison. It's actually, a, uh, well, uh, it's kind of a, an article that he wrote, which kind of summarizes the main points for, of his, from his book, a beautiful book that he wrote. It's called When Languages Die, The Extinction of the World's Languages and the Erosion of Human Knowledge. Um, and the second one is a brief article by John McWhorter published um, in the journal World Affairs, and it's called The Cosmopolitan Tongue, The Universality of English. And so here the students are supposed to read the, the two articles. Each one represents one poll in this debate and um, kind of summarize the argument and present their, you know, evaluate whose point of view uh, they think is stronger and which point of view they support. So let's look at that. Um, so the first quote is by Harrison, who of course, he is a person who travels the world. Um, he goes to remote corners of the world, lives with the indigenous people, studies their languages, and he advocates for the preservation of language diversity. And the view that um, when he tries to convince people that this is a worthy enterprise, um, he puts it this way, language disappearance is an erosion or extinction of ideas a way of knowing uh, and um, ways of knowing and ways of talking about the world and human experience. Ken Hale, who worked on many endangered languages up until his death in 201, told the reporter, when you lose a language, you lose a culture, intellectual wealth, a work of art. It's like dropping a bomb in a museum, the Louvre. And so that kind of sums up the position of the people in that camp who feel the pain of the, all the disappearing languages 
And when they argue that this needs to be, so it's, it's a serious issue and we need to do something to re stop and reverse this process, they typically express it that way that languages code the wisdom of humanity and with each dead language, we lose some part of that wisdom. And of course, that has this really, it, and of course, I completely sympathize with this sentiment, and I and I agree with the desire to preserve the languages. But I also can see how and why many linguists feel reluctant to accept that point of view, simply because the mainstream position in linguistics and in cognitive science is not to conflate knowledge and language of culture and language that the two things are separable of course they're intimately connected and um but um we i think many linguists when they hear this although nobody celebrates the loss of languages i think many linguists uh, cannot accept the idea that with the disappearance of language we we'll lose the knowledge or we we'll lose the culture because culture if if a, a culture shifts to a new language the culture can still continue. Of course, it will be changed into something else. And as John McWhorter takes that position, and his example was that look at um, African American cultures, people, um, they created this vibrant, rich, unique culture, but they don't speak Yoruba or Igbo or Fulani. So then culture does not die when language dies and knowledge does not die. We can translate uh, the knowledge, we can distill the knowledge and, and express it in, in another language. So people who find it difficult to accept this idea that language and culture and language and knowledge are inseparable tend to then take this opposite position and say that the main loss, and now I'm reading from John McWhorter, the main loss when a language dies is not cultural, but aesthetic. And um, I, one might disagree that aesthetic loss is something that we shouldn't worry about. Losing something aesthetic is also very serious, but at least we could, I think we could probably, many of us would agree that a culture does not have to die if a language dies, although it, it will be, as long as people are alive, of course, if <laughs> there are no more people uh, who practice that culture, the culture will die. And, um, and then there's this other aspect. So um, people like um, David Harrison and um, who, are, who argue for the preservation of languages, they also tend to try to uh, justify their position by saying that each language is unique and they, and they want to prove this kind of uniqueness of each language and um, how uh, a language, for example, I don't know, Hawaiian has all of these different words for ocean waves or Australian languages have different names for local flora and fauna, different words for different types of kangaroo and uh, possums and various indigenous plants. And uh, if we lose the language, we'll lose all that knowledge. So it has this very strong flavor of linguistic relativism. And that's another thing that uh, many mainstream linguists cannot agree with. And so their reaction is then uh, like John McWhorter to continue. And what he said is that, and I, now we'll continue with his quote, viscerally as a great fan of Russian for many years, I am as uncomfortable as anyone else with the prospect of Russian no longer being passed on to children. However, I'm also aware that mine is not necessarily a logical discomfort. So he thinks, of course, I, as a linguist, I love all languages. In this case, he gives an example of Russian. It's his hobby to study Russian. But it wouldn't be rational to feel so sad if Russian just disappeared. And it's because people, um, linguists like John McWhorter, believe, do not believe in language relativity. They, they believe in language universals that um, all of these differences between languages are strictly superficial, but and all of them can be just reduced to a set of parameters, a few dozen perhaps. And um, if lo losing a language does not really erode diversity. 
at all because all languages are ultimately cut from the same cloth. And um, so just continue with what he said, coming back to the Tower of Babel, can we say that the benefits of linguistic diversity are more important than the impediment to communication that they entail? At the end of the day, language death is ironically a symptom of people coming together. And so when I read this essay, I had these conflicted, conflicted feelings. On the one hand, I completely sympathize and I feel the pain of the language loss and language disappearance. And I feel viscerally <laughs> kind of, it, 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 it's, it was honestly quite repellent to read, to, to read the sentiments like that, that losing Russian, which happens to be my native language is, and mourning the loss purely hypothetically, of course, in the case of Russian is irrational. But on the other hand, what about language, you know, what about language universals? What about um, rejecting language relativity and, and all that? So I gave it some thought and I asked myself, why is it that I agree with some of the things that John McWhorter says that are theoretical about separability of language and culture and language and thought? But on the other hand, I find his argument repellent. <laughs> Well, it's because Russian is my native language. It's the language that I was, I heard when I was born. And that's the language my mother read stories to me when I was sick as a child. This is the language that um, I, th that um, I used when I learned everything about the world, about myself and how to relate to other people. And so just imagining that that language would die and that I imagine that um, I am the last speaker of that language fills me with this unimaginable dread because it's a really strong threat to my identity as a human being. And this is why, and, and so this is really the main point um, that I want to make is that, um, sorry, um, as a native speaker, I have the, I, it's completely justifiable and completely logical and completely rational of, for me to mourn the loss of my language, if that were the case. In my case, Russian is safe. It's, but what about speakers of all of these countless languages that are disappearing? What about these last 20 or fewer speakers of Italian spoken in Kamchatka? or the less than three speakers left of this Australian language. How must they feel that uh, the language of their ancestors, of their parents is no longer going to be used and nobody cares about that. And uh, the world just shrugs and moves on. Kurdelaine, two speakers. I, I know two speakers. Uh, this Khoisan language, one speaker, just imagining being the last speaker of a language, you, you can imagine the unbearable loneliness that this person must feel. And so that brings me to really my main point of this talk, that mourning language loss does not have to be justified through, through theory. You don't have to prove that the languages are unique or that language and culture are inseparable and we will be losing some, some unique wisdom of the people. Whether or not this is true, I don't even want to now argue for one position or, or, or another. It's a topic for a different um, for conversation. But each language has intrinsic value for its speakers. And that's the main issue that I think is lost in the linguistic debate. That every, the loss of every language is human tragedy for those last speakers that survive language loss. The la languages are not lost instantly unless a bomb is dropped and somehow everybody is wiped out at the same time. Usually there are people who are watching the disappearance of their language and falling, it falling into obscurity and irrelevance. And, um, that is a human tragedy. And I think that regardless of whether you subscribe to the theory of universal grammar or linguistic relativity, it doesn't really matter which one is correct. I think we should uh, take a language preservation as a matter of human rights and not a matter of linguistic theory. And I think linguists maybe have the responsibility as we as the field that create knowledge in this field, we study languages, I think we need to advocate um, 
on for language preservation on these humanitarian grounds more so than on any theoretical ground because if we argue it as a theory we'll lose a lot of people um, in the debate especially because the debate is usually conducted in english or a few other winner languages and they don't feel the um you know when you when you're an english speaker and that's your native language you don't really understand and feel the tragedy of losing your language because obviously English is a very successful language and um, according to McWhorter in that article, it might be the, the last and the only language and that will ultimately will take over the world. So the rest of the talk, I decided to kind of, um, based on uh, what John McWhorter was um, saying in his um, in his article, I decided to kind of frame my the rest of the talk in terms of myths, because I think there are some implications on what he was saying, how language loss is not really uh, tragic. It's he was implying that it's pretty much benign. People are coming together. They're just choosing modernity, choosing unity. And somehow it's inevitable. And um, so I formulated this first two myths um, and I'm going to you know, try to argue that they are myths and not what really happens. So it's not natural, it's not benign. And then for the third myth, there is, it's, he didn't talk really about um, the economic implications, but maybe it, he did imply a little bit that it's kind of economically more expedient if everybody just spoke the same language and uh, we should strive for homogeneity rather than diversity. So I'm going to talk about this one. And for this one, I actually did some quantitative analysis of some data that I will present at the end. So here we go. So the first um, point that I want to make with regard to the first two myths is that um, languages disappear not um, because their speakers somehow stop valuing them not adults, <laughs> young children, as John Harrison actually um, explains that it really happens during childhood because children are really good social barometers and they sense when their, their language is devalued by society and they, and they shift from the language of their parents to the more dominant language. But really what happens is that um, conditions um, are created such that some languages become pariahs and um, so yeah, the young generation, the children, stop uh, acquiring them naturally. So conditions are created so that um, intergeneration, intergenerational language transmission it becomes difficult or impossible. But it's outside of people's control. It's not something that just happens naturally as in the course of the evolution of language. And the conditions leading to situations of language endangerment are socially engineered in most cases. And I have to say with the caveat, of course, language change is natural. And um, so of course, you know, language changes and some varieties fall out of use for, for example, vulgar Latin spread into various Romance languages, but the classical Latin, which was one variety of Latin, the high variety, um, stopped being used as a living language and it was just preserved as a liturgical written language. So that happens a lot. Um, in history, there is Vedic Sanskrit versus Prakrit languages, or you can give an example of Old Persian as opposed to Modern Persian and, and other um, Iranian languages like Dari and Kurdish and Tajik. So this is not the situation I'm talking about. So we, I'm not talking about Latin or um, Vedic Sanskrit or Old Persian kind of language deaths. I'm talking about the language deaths documented on that map of um, which are mostly, which are indigenous languages. And so let's uh, take the first myth that language um, loss is some kind of a natural phenomenon and just an un unavoidable process of human language evolution. And um, here you see a picture of um, the Stonehenge and um, it, 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 which of course is a, an, an interesting place, a place of mystery because these ancient people built it and we don't know who they were and what happened to them. 
And so I wanted to talk about this example of what happened to ancient, uh, the original Europeans as one case study of what how language death comes about. So we know that first humans arrived in Europe during the, this initial process of the peopling of the world approximately 37,000 years ago. And uh, so they were hunting together tribes living in Europe. And uh, so one of, some, one of these tribes built a Stonehenge, what happened? We, we also know that currently most European languages, almost all of the current approximately 400 European languages belong to this one big Indo-European language family. And the words that they did not, they, this was not the language of the original Europeans, right? So this is the two, the, the two top hypotheses for when Indo-European language spread and where it came from is the Anatolian hypothesis. So it, it was the ancient farmers um, approximately eight to nine and a half thousand years ago from Anatolia. So the Middle East from here, perhaps they, they migrated and they were the first who brought an Indo-European, you know, a, an Indo-European language, um, or the second hypothesis is the steppe hypothesis. So the Pontic steppes, the steppes between the Black and the Caspian Sea, the current um, present day Russia and Ukraine, the culture that's called Yamnaya, which is a term from archeology, span from Russian, it's an ar Russian archeological term. It means pit, pit graves. So these, this culture was characterized by a particular type of pit grave. So we also know that they existed about much, you know, more recent than the Anatolian hypothesis, about five to 6,000 years ago, they were herders. Um, and um, that's the second hypothesis. So at some point, relatively recently compared to 37,000 years ago, right, a tribe arrived in Europe and um, we have now languages almost in, almost all of the languages that exist in Europe can be traced back to this group of people. And so how did that happen? And it's interesting that recently, because of the advances in genetics and um, particularly ancient DNA studies, the linguistic history is becoming more clear and it's really quite striking. So, um, Let's ask, so what happened to the original Europeans? And here you see a picture of this very interesting archaeological site in the UK. Um, I think it's, it's much more interesting even than uh, the Stonehenge because it, was, it led to a lot of interesting discoveries. It's called West Kennet Long Barrow. And it was built circa 3650 BCE. And uh, it was used as a burial site. And um, so it was excavated and they were approximately 50 uh, individuals that were buried at around this time. But what's interesting is that the site was being visited for about a thousand years. And so there were artifacts and re human remains that were um, much younger than the original ones. And so it was being used in a really interesting study of ancient DNA to, to answer the question, so how did the population change in Europe? Um, and um, so what happened? The, the reason that they were able to do the study is that because they, through archeology, span they know um, they could date the spread of the so-called Bell Beaker culture. So there was a culture that uh, was widespread across Western and Central Europe at around 2750 to 25 BC, BCE. And um, so the, we know from this common type of pottery that they used, it was all kind of one connected culture. There was cultural contact between people from different parts of Europe. And we, we know how to date it. We know when it's originated approximately. So um, by taking the ancient DNA from uh, the remain, human remains that could be dated before the beaker, the spread of the beaker culture, 
and also during the spread of the beaker culture you could you could see how the population changed and you can also even answer this really interesting question were the changes in ancient europe a result of migration of ideas or migration of people migration of ideas so if people just travel around and they brought their culture and uh, it was embraced by the locals it's much more um language perhaps is part of that and it's just much more benign right it's uh, what, what we think usually what happens but um if the dna study actually tells a different more sinister story so let's look at some of the papers so this is one paper that was published in nature in 2018 alalde and all this is the um and uh, the conclusion from that paper was that the genetic ancestry of Neolith Neolithic Britons who built a barrow that I just showed you was almost entirely displaced by the step DNA. So when you compare the pre-beaker and the beaker associated culture, you can see that the DNA was 90% um, of, of it was different. This is, by the way, the shape of this beaker, uh, bell beaker pottery. So they looked, they basically took um, genome-wide data from 400 individuals from different um, um, periods, Neolithic, Copper Age, and Bronze Age Europeans from multiple different sites um, associated with the Bika complex artifacts and uh, that ranged over wide um, historical period. And uh, they um, discovered that there was a very high level of the step related ancestry. So the ancestry of the Yamna culture, and it was associated with the replacement of 90% of Britain's gene pool within a few hundred years. And that was part of the continuing east to west expansion that had brought the step related ancestry into Central and Northern Europe over the previous century. So that's one, um, so 90% of the DNA is different in, in the UK. Here's another paper that's a, a, also published um, in Nature by Hag et al. Um, DNA evidence of the steppe origin of Indo-European. So in this uh, paper, they um, analyze, again, they look at ancient DNA and they um, take DNA from different sites and they established kind of distinct um, genomes of pre-Indo-Europeans, the hunter-gatherer tribes, and there were distinct hunter-gatherer tribes. There were Eastern hunter-gatherers, uh, Northern hunter-gatherers, and Western hunter-gatherers. And then um, they also isolate DNA of their Anatolian farmers that migrated here, and they could tell that um, they can date the DNA and they can see um, how distinct they were from the local hunter-gatherers. And then finally look at the Yamna culture DNA, which, so the Yamna culture arose somewhere between six to 5,000 years ago. And, uh, and they're looking at the DNA, they could see that at, at around 4,500 um, years ago, Western and Eastern Europe came into contact and um, the culture that this is a di different one called corded ware, again, named after a distinct type of pottery. So th that's the culture that was spread in the north and central, northern and central Europe. And so when they look at the DNA of this culture at, at around this period, this is when they say the west and the east came into contact. They, they discovered that um, the corded ware people from present day Germany, 75% um, of their ancestry can be um, traced back to the steppe um, culture, to the Yamna culture. And they also make a statement that uh, that DNA, the steppe DNA is ubiquitous in present day Europeans. So basically the picture emerges and they argue that this really supports the steppe hypothesis for the Indo-European that these people didn't just um, have contact like the like the Anatolian farmers. They really, it, it supports the view that there was a vast migration of people and kind of um, the replacement of the local cultures with, uh, well, 
the replacement of the local DNA with the with the east, uh, you know, the step DNA. And um, they think that this is actually in support of the um, step hypothesis for the origin of the Indo-European. And uh, there is more. I mean, I think the evidence of the step origins of the Europeans, at least as people, you know, genetically, is mounting. So here's a paper shows that um, they found uh, gen genomic step ancestry in Denmark. This is in Poland. And, uh, and here there is a little hint of what I'm about to say. In this um, paper, they show that when you look at this ancient DNA in, in this Polish sample, it, they found that maternally the individuals are linked to early Neolithic lineages, whereas on the paternal side, it's a step ancestry. So there is this interesting dissociation. Maternally, there are this local pre-Indo-Europeans, pre but paternally, they are, they are the Yamnet step people. And then the fine, um, well, okay, so, that, that this is just kind of shows this hypothesis. So protein the European culture came from the steppes, they migrated, they settled, somehow mated with the locals, and then eventually all these language families came, language um, branches of in the European language family came into being here. And also, of course, in the Aryan and Iranian Tocharian is not is extinct. The, um, the, there is some linguistic evidence for this hypothesis because uh, this culture apparently was the culture that domesticated the horse, and so there were the horse and um, carriage, the horse and buggy people. So they invented uh, this kind of chariots, apparently, and there's linguistic reconstruction of the words for horse and wheel. There are cognates in um, many of the Indo-European languages that can be reconstructed to this Proto-Indo-European roots for horse and wheel. This is an interesting engraving that they found on a, a steppe nomad pottery vessel that shows a horse and, and a two-wheel carriage. So that's kind of just looks pretty benign, but um, here are some more. I just think that this is a kind of a cool graphic from a paper, a linguistic paper, that shows the um, the various cognates of these various um, words for wheel and um, parts of the wheel in um, multiple in the European language family, in the European language subfamilies. But now to my main point, so how did the linguistic and genetic composition of Europe, um, how did it get so completely reshaped by a single group? And um, this, the paper that, that um, by Goldberg et al from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences kind of maybe is quite revealing. It's something that the previous paper from the Polish sample was also hinting at. So in this, um, th this team zeroed in on the differences in the ratio of the DNA that was inherited on the X chromosome compared with the rest of the uh, other 22 chromosomes that um, are not determinative of, of the sex of the individual. So by looking at these differences, they could actually quantify and figure out the ratio of men versus women in during this migration of the culture of the Yamna culture into Central and um, Western Europe. And they, co they come to the conclusion that the migration involved 10 men for every woman, which they call an extreme ratio, even more lopsided than the wave of Spanish conquistadors who came by ship to the Americas in the late 1500s. And so this is just an artistic rendering um, of what a Yamna person looked like in their horse-drawn carriage. And so, but the story that is being told, I think, in these papers is that there was this massive migration of men who, who were riding horses. They were probably armed because they, the, the, how does the DNA get replaced? It wasn't some kind of a natural process of evolution or probably not even a voluntary 
uh, kind of the, the women didn't voluntarily just choose to completely stop mating with the local man and choosing the the, the new handsome young man it was probably a violent um situation and the people uh, who wrote the paper i read some interviews they think that um it was probably the worst or one of the worst genocides in human history when the uh, the spread of the european language took place and so that's was kind of, I wanted, when I read all of this, it was kind of eye-opening for me because I never before thought that um, the spread of Indo-European was some kind of a violent process. And of course, if we look in different uh, times in history, it happens again and again and again. So if we look at Celtic and the history of the Celts, we can see on this map, this, this bright green is the, the area where at the, the maximal Celtic expansion, they lived all over Europe, including in Anatolia. Um, and now um, there, the, the dark green shows where in present day Celtic languages are still spoken. Gaelic Irish is an endangered language in the Republic of Ireland. That's um, Pretty, pretty staggering if you think about it if you in historical terms and we know how that happened so the roman empire first uh, subjugated you know conquered subjugated and assimilated the celts and then of course the british um so it wasn't um again a natural some kind of process of natural language evolution it was just a, it, it was um part of uh, one culture subjugating another. If you look at Sumerian, um, so Sumerian, maybe the people who likely were the first who invented writing and they invented so the cuneiform writing, which was adopted by many other uh, cultures surrounding them, including the Akkadian speakers who used the cuneiform to write Akkadian. Um, so it was a very advanced culture. They were the ones that uh, perhaps the first who built the cities, who invented irrigation and agriculture and, and, and all of that. So it was a really advanced civilization with writing, but um, they were overrun um, by King Sargon I, who was the first Assyrian king. They sacked the cities. And so now we have, um, so this is a poem, Lament for Ur, the city, one of the, one of the ancient Sumerian city around 2000 BC. When they overthrew, when order they destroyed, then like a deluge, all things together, the enemy consumed. Whereunto, O Sumer, did they change thee? They demolished the city, they demolished the temple, they seized the rulership of the land. So it describes what happened. And so Sumerian um, is an extinct language. And of course, Akkadian also now is an extinct language because there was a succession of empires conquering one another. So Akkadian was replaced by Aramaic, Aramaic was replaced by Arabic. And so that happens in history over and over again. And so this is my point that language death is really socially engineered. Small languages grow and take over large territories through um, military um, Cont contest, colonization, repression, and political and economic domination. And even large healthy written languages with strong regional influence may shrink, weaken, and die out. It's, 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 real, it's never benign. Um, so speakers are often wiped out by war, disease, natural disasters, or they stop using their language under political repression or threats of violence. So here is a picture of a group of natives of Tasmania. So there was Tasmanian genocide and all of the languages were wiped out because all of the speakers were wiped out. What happened to the Caribbean indigenous languages? The same thing. If you think about more recent history, Yiddish, 85% uh, of the people who perished in the Holocaust were speakers of Yiddish. And um, that language was a vibrant language in Eastern Europe and now it's an endangered language. It's no longer really spoken much in, in Europe at all. It still is spoken by a lot of people in North America, but um, the status is definitely endangered. Rapa Nui, um, so the island, 
that is used often to um, as an as a cautionary tale. It was uh, in, in made famous by Jer Jerry Diamond in his book Collapse, in which he argued that Rapin Nui, because of kind of what they did to themselves, they mismanaged their resources and they caused their own collapse. But um, it turns out the more recent research shows that really it's not the case and that um, really the society was not in any state of collapse until 1860s when slave traders from Peru raided the island and they captured the majority of their population, basically taken most of the people into slavery. Some of them escaped, came back, but brought diseases and that really decimated the population and really that's what happened. And um, that's why Rapa Nui is a nearly extinct language. Of course, there was also, um, I don't really have time. I really need to uh, move, move on to my next point if I want to finish on time. But there was not just physical genocide, but cultural gen genocide it perpetuated in many countries where these schools were instituted and indigenous children was taken from their parents forcibly and uh, re-educated so that the native languages could be erased and um, they can be inculcated and the dominant language and culture and religion. One of the most shocking things to me when I was doing this research is that how endangered Hawaiian is. I did not really realize that, but according to the Endangered Language Project, there is only about 300 speakers of Hawaiian left. I just couldn't believe that. I somehow thought, I knew that it was gonna be endangered, um, but I did not know to what extent. And it says there on their website, there is a quote from one of the speakers who is still a native speaker of Hawaiian that a stigma persisted in the 20th century in which government and society look down upon the Hawaiian language, its speakers, its value, its contribution to Hawaii's unique culture. The result was the decimation of Hawaiian speaking communities coupled with low self-esteem among Hawaiian speakers and the end of the trans transmittal of cultural and esoteric knowledge embedded in the language. So again, it's not that they just chose not to speak Hawaiian, it's because the stigma and discrimination that was um, they were subject subjected to. So um, uh, another point, Language minorities are socially disadvantaged everywhere you look. They're the most vulnerable members of society. For example, they were disproportionately affected by COVID-19. We know it's one of the groups that was um, disproportionately affected. So this is a picture from the New York Times of Aruka Juma, who was the last surviving ma uh, man of the Amazonian Juma people who just died, recently died of COVID. And so now there are, there are no more speakers left of that language. Um, so that was kind of the uh, the end of my the, 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 the dark realities part of my talk. And now I want to maybe quickly go over the little study that I did. I was really interested in, in tr trying to see if there is any um, empirical support to the idea that maybe linguistic diversity, well, we might value it, but maybe societally it's kind of burdensome and uh, economically detrimental, maybe homogeneity if we can bring all people together and we can just forget all the multiple languages, just speak one language, we will be, uh, maybe it would be uh, progress. So I, of course, I did not really answer that question, but um, so let me just show you what I did and um, see what we can make of it. So I took um, global literacy data, which is all of the data that I worked with was publicly available quantitative data. So I downloaded a spreadsheet with global literacy rates from the UNESCO Institute of Statistics. Here there are some numbers. The, the, the literacy rates range in the world from only 22%. That's among adults, 15 and individuals 15 years old and over, between 22% to almost 100%. I also took the language diversity index, the LDI that I told, told you about in the beginning, that ranges between zero and 0.988. I also took gross national income per capita as just as a measure of um, economic success. I used the literacy data because this is what I could think of in how to measure success of a society. So if a society can educate most of their, or all or close to all of their 
members, that it's one measure of social success. That's why I looked at literacy data. And then I also found something that's called Gini coefficient, which is used in economics as a measure of income inequality. So the higher it is, the more income inequality there is in society. So um, it, it, there is the, the proverbial case, if you say that the richest 20% have 80% of all the income, it would translate into um, the Gini coefficient of 60 on, and above. And we had in, in my sample, I had countries with uh, that index, but any and also all the way down to 25. Altogether, I, once I included countries that had all of that information, I had 151 countries on my sample. And so first I just looked at correlations uh, between um, literacy rate, GNI per capita and language diversity. I will talk about the inequality next separately. So first I just wanted to see, is there a kind of, a, is, is there an association between literacy rate and linguistic diversity? And I found there is a significant negative association. The higher um, the LDI, the lower is the literacy rate. It's a moderate but uh, significant correlation. There was also a positive correlation between GNI per capita and literacy rate. So the higher the income per capita, the higher the, the literacy rate. Um, just to make sure that they make independent contributions and not so um, somehow through being confounded to each other. I also did partial correlations between literacy rate and GNI per capita controlling for LDI. Um, um, and then um, I'm not sure I'm now, now looking. I, I think I kind of erroneously put a... Um, uh, the negative sign here is, is an error, it must be, it's, it, it's not negative, it, so I'm sorry about that, it's, it's uh, like this, um, it's a positive correlation, but there is a negative correlation between LDI and literacy rate con con controlling for GNI per capita. So um, finding this correlation, what I did next, I grouped all the countries in my sample into four groups based on their language diversity. I took the mean language diversity and one standard deviation to, do, to group them into four different groups. So the countries that had language diversity, more than one standard deviation below the mean, I put them in group zero, which is low LDI. The group that had um, their language diversity within one standard deviation below the mean, so no more than one standard deviation below the mean, were group one, so moderately low LDI. This group number two, um, th their LDI was up to one standard deviation above the mean, so the moderately high LDI, and the last group high LDI. So their LDI was more than one standard deviation above the mean in the sample. And then I compared them here on GNI per capita and here on literacy. And you can see that uh, the group that has the, low, the, the highest LDI in both cases has the lowest income um, and the lowest um, literacy rate. And um, so there was no significant difference between group zero and group one in, in either case, but then the, the significant differences were between uh, the, the rest of the comparisons. So you may then ask, uh, so maybe it's not really a miss, maybe it is true that um, uh, that uh, there is a detriment to linguistic diversity, to linguistic diversity in terms of how many people can get an education in terms of literacy and economic development. But I think this is really not, um, it, it's just shows an association. It does not really show causation at all. And um, then when I look, looked at the, I compared the same four groups on the inequality index, the Gini index, um, what you find again, the same thing. So the group with the highest LDI has the highest level of inequality. There was a significant difference. And um, so there is also an association within, between language diversity and inequality. And I think now when you look at that in this context, it starts to make more sense. 
Um, so the association exists not because linguistic diversity somehow causes economic disadvantage or educational disadvantage, but because um, countries with a lot with um, high linguistic diversity has a large first proportion of the population who are language minorities, and they're being discriminated against. And um, they speak non-institutional minority languages. They don't have equal access to education and they don't have equal access to um, economic resources. And that's why we see these associations between a lower level of um, literacy and high level of um, linguistic diversity. So economic inequality likely translates into linguistic inequality. And so language minorities are deprived of opportunities. They, um, they don't have an opportunity to receive an education in their mother tongue because most of these languages are non-institutional. There are only a few institutional languages in any country. So when children go to school, they have to learn to read in a language that is not their language. Often it's the first introduction to the language is through being taught to read and just imagine how hard that is. And they are not able to develop additive bilingualism. They are not able to maintain one, one, their own language while also learning a second language. Instead, they're somehow forced into this um, subtractive bilingualism when they have to learn a new language and forget the, the native one. Basically, languages are weakened because people's economic survival dictates that they have to abandon their lifestyle and their language and culture and adopt the culture of the majority. And um, I just want to, I think that the languages that, that share space do not have to be in competition with, with each other. It doesn't have to be a zero sum game. That, that doesn't have to be winners and losers because individual level bilingualism, so individuals who are bilingual, it's a completely commonplace phenomenon anywhere in the world. And it's possible and it's uh, to uh, create stable multilingual societies. Um, and societal multilingualism is viewed as a positive force in, in any of the places where languages have equal status. And um, you know, you all you know know examples like that. Countries that have successful multilingualism, where, where languages are equally valued and respected, and there is there are opportunities to be educated and in, uh, in your mother tongue. So that's basically. I think um, I'm out of time, and I want to just end with this take home message that um, language loss and linguistic inequality have real victims. It's not just a theoretical debate. And um, it's irrelevant whether or not knowledge and culture are separable. And it's irrelevant um, whether we believe in linguistic relativity or not. I think that protecting language diversity is not a member, is, is not a matter of really preserving knowledge so much, but it's a matter of defending human rights. Um, this is um, my last slide, and I wanted to show you the picture of this man, Albert Razin. He was an Udmurt language activist. Udmurt is a Uralic language spoken in Russia, and it's a stable language. It's um, and he um, was an advocate for the language rights, but in um, he recently the Russian government made a change in the law and uh, so they no longer require people in, uh, in these autonomous regions that have their regional languages to study these languages at school it's now optional and so a family can just simply declare Russian their native language and so languages like Udmurt would no longer be obligatorily taught in school. And so in protest to that, because he saw what was coming, that this small change in the law will inevitably will, will uh, lead to the erosion of the language and language death. He marched to the um, city hall and he set himself on fire and he died of self-immolation in 2019 to protest and um, to, to make a really unbelievably uh, radical statement against the loss of linguistic diversity. And I think that kind of speaks volumes that 
English speakers and maybe Russian speakers and French speakers can debate whether language diversity is valuable or not. But if you ask the speakers of the languages that are being lost, I think they will all universally will tell you that they don't want their language to die. Maybe I will play a two minute clip. Um, it's a work called Last Whispers by uh, Lina Herzog. She's an artist who is doing this um, installation, but it's just um, dedicated to the, to the languages that are being lost. I just think it's really good. It's only two minutes long. Thank you. Thank you so much. That concludes uh, the presentation portion of this brown bag. We still have a couple minutes if individuals want to stay on for some question and answer. I'm just going to stop sharing the screen so it's better for our host. So if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand with the icon or physically raise your hand and um, our speaker and Dr. Edwards will call on you and just unmute your mic. I see uh, Liliana's hand. <laughs> what a powerful presentation, Natasha. I really see your struggle and you really um, told it so well. And, and I think your conclusion that this is not just some kind of scientific question is right on target. Um, and one thing that I think um, could, also, could be, on the other hand, also a scientific issue, is I do think um, that uh, uh, the loss of language is also gradually the loss of the genetic pool, um, as you also um, identified with Indo-European. So when, for example, Native American languages diminished, um, their populations also diminished. Um, so there is definitely a genetic loss going on with language loss. 
Um, there must be a correlation there. I don't know if people are studying that, but language is really not just words and knowledge. Um, it is one's identity, um, one's pride. It's not just the words, it's the rhythm, the tone, the feeling, um, but also one's identity. And, and when that is eroded, then of course, um, uh, the, the population that speaks that language is gonna erode too. And gradually the genetic makeup will change. So um, I, I think your conclusions are right on target there. And thank you. Thank you so much, Liliana. Yeah, uh, if you think about, um, for example, American, Native American languages, just think about how Native Americans now are such a small minority in the land where we are all, you know, immigrants or people who brought who were brought here against their will, against their will. They're the, the, the original Americans, and they're a small minority in their own land. And and very few of them now speak their, their ancestral languages. For example, Cherokee, I looked it up. The Cherokee tri uh, tribe is the largest nation um, registered in, in the United States. There are almost over 400, uh, about 400,000 tribal citizens, but only a very small portion, only about 2,000 speak Cherokee language. Do we have any other questions? Uh, I see Robert, yep, yeah, you can go. Is your mic unmuted? Looks like it is, but we can't hear you. And also, if anyone... Okay, is that... Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious about when you determine that a language splits or combines or goes extinct. Um, for example, I, I, I think there's a debate whether Flemish is a dialect of Dutch or whether it's a separate language. Uh, I'm functionally bilingual in French. I can't understand Haitian French. I had the same thing happen to me in Northern Ireland. He was speaking English, I was speaking English, and we couldn't understand a word each of us spoke. So how do the experts define when a language becomes a language? Yeah, that's a difficult question. Yeah, so it's one of the first things we discuss in the languages of the world is that it's a, the, the boundary between dialects and distinct languages is fuzzy and often political. So you, linguists would like to uh, use something more objective and for they use um, the, some kind of a linguistic criterion and the best that we can come up with usually is mutual intelligibility. Once, if the mutual intelligibility is high enough, we call them dialects. And if it's below a certain threshold, we call them separate languages. And often very related dialects, if people get separated politically, geographically, they become distinct, they diverse, they become more and more different from each other and mutual intelligibility becomes lower and then they kind of slide into being different languages when before in, previously in history, they were just different dialects. So I guess, <laughs> but it's a kind of a fuzzy, um, fuzzy line. The, the same as taxonomy for species? <laughs> Is it? I don't know. I really don't know much about it. But yeah, probably. Yeah. So we have time for one more question. And John, you have your hand up. So just unmute your mic. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I was uh, totally taken by uh, uh, her talk. It was uh, very uh, moving. Oh, I'm not available. I'm sorry. Um, I I'm sorry. Uh, I, I thought it was very uh, moving. I remember growing up as a young uh, man with Polish. But my family didn't want to teach it. Uh, and then as I got older, they did. And a little bit, but they did it a little ways. Like uh, we would name it, she named a dog Piesek. Well, that means dog in Polish. But, you know, that's, they would speak to it when, I, when we weren't listening. But, but it, it also occurred 
we were third generation Polish Americans, and yet there was this uh, fear of, of that we would be categorized as an immigrant if we knew Polish. And I kind of wonder if that kind of thing is also occurring as social development occurs. I think that's exactly, it's, it's very similar, except in those other cases, you wouldn't be considered an immigrant, but you would be considered this backward person from the hills or from the tundra that usually, you know, the people who, indigenous, speakers of indigenous languages, um, when they try to hold on to their um, traditional lifestyle, which doesn't usually fit well with the modern lifestyle, they get stigmatized for that. And um, so, it, it, yeah, it's almost like they're made to feel, well, not an immigrant, but like an outsider in, in their own, in, in the larger culture, if they speak their, if their indigenous language. I see Martha. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, this uh, was a wonderful talk. I think it's the best I've heard on the on the very complex topic of language endangerment and why it happens and what its significance is. And I think uh, 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 cap capsulating it as you did as a matter of human rights is exactly exactly the right approach. Um, so thank you so much. I saw at the very end, uh, the, the very last screen, you have a publication coming out about this, but I, it went by so fast I couldn't see it. What it's is that? Just, just the quantity, the, the, part, the part that's the numbers, the analysis that I presented, not the, not the whole thing. It was, it's a chapter that I contributed to it. It's, it's, it's from a volume called, um, it's, it's, it's a volume called Handbook of Literacy in Diglossia and Dialectal Contexts. And um, I was invited, uh, so my co-author, Lena Grigorenka, you know her, um, and she invited me to contribute to a chapter she was writing. And um, I didn't know what to do. And that's, I did that analysis that I presented. Okay. Then I, when I was preparing this talk, I kind of thought maybe it fits into the general. <laughs> in the, the general topic about the myths that people have about diversity. I think you should write up the big ideas though and, and, and put that in some kind of public forum, not necessarily in a uh, specialist journal, but something uh, in a newspaper, in a, in a, you know, a, uh, uh, a magazine that will be read widely by people because I think your ideas are exactly on point and McWhorter needs to be countered. <laughs> I agree. I agree with that idea completely. I think that's exactly what you should do. Thank you so much. You, it's a new way of looking at it, but I think I think exactly the right way. Thank you, Kennedy. Do you think that we can ask Jackson, or do we need to answer to to end? Or can Jackson? No, no, no. We can stay on a little longer. He had his hand up, so you can go ahead and ask your question. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Kennedy. I just wanted to add that I've been researching this exact topic of language deaths specifically in France with their regional languages where they used to have hundreds and hundreds of them. And ever since the French put it into their their like government documents that France is the official language. They, I loved the word that you used. It was a socially engineered like systemic deletion and erasure of all of the different languages that they had. And I've been going through just documenting, I chose six of them somewhat arbitrarily, but just everything that they've gone through from being completely silenced and just shown that like you as a language and as a culture do not matter. And it was just amazing. And John, going off of what you said too, there's a word specifically in Occitan that they made to like capture the sense of shame and worthlessness that they felt for being Occitan speakers in a placed in a government where France was the only legitimate language that they viewed. So I, it was a wonderful talk that I felt really captured all of the sense of everything that these people feel. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, at, at the very end, I want to run the credits because this is the last um, talk in our series. And I want you to put your hands together and and uh, for two, two chairs, one, the, the over 50 speakers that participated in this series. 
and um, more immediately to give uh, Kennedy Cockrell, uh, who is um, this, the Brangba coordinator <clears throat> for the center who was involved in every single one of these talks and um, with the same positive can-do attitude. Um, she is an absolutely wonderful worker. So I, I, I thank her for that. And I, I leave with, with the one last um, comment to answer um, Bob Holly's question about in, uh, mutual intelligibility. Sometimes the, the, the question is not just linguistic mutual intelligibility. I always give an example of Arikun and Akawayo in Guyana. They are both Caribbean languages. Akawayo and Arikuna are linguistically uh, very close. The, one of the, the, the main difference between the two is that Akawayo has voice top strings and um, Arikuna doesn't. But in my, in my work um, space, so I was the director of the Amerindian Languages Project. We worked with an Amerindian from, from uh, Purima and uh, who speaks uh, Arikuna and um, an Amerindian um, from Ramadan that speaks Akwayo and they, they were the sources of our data. And the Arikuna person would swear that he does not understand a word of, um, of Akwayo. And the Akwayo speaker swears that she understands everything that the, that the Arikuna person is saying. But yeah. Arikunas think themselves much high, uh, higher than the Akwayos, and therefore it is a psychological, it's not just, a, not, not just linguistically um, unintelligible um, in, in, intelligibility, but sometimes um, uh, psychological and social psychological. But that's just a little comment. And I thought this was a wonderful paper. If, um, if the speaker gives us permission to, to post this talk on the on our website, I'd be delighted. And I would be, I would uh, use that last uh, graphic or video, the last whispers to send to some of my colleagues in Guyana because it captures uh, very well sort of uh, the tragedy of the loss of languages across time. But um, let's give a final thank you to Natalia for an excellent paper. And those of you who are faculty, uh, remember that the center is recruiting for uh, speakers for next year. And if you are so inclined, we'd be very happy to, to host you. But thank you all again. Yeah. Kennedy, you have to tell her about our little gifts. Yes. So um, on behalf of the Humanity Center, as a small token of our gratitude, we do have two gifts for you, a mask and a journal with the Humanity Center logo on it. Um, and I'm going to be reaching out to you individually towards maybe into the summer to safely get these gifts to you because of the virus. But thank you so much. This was a well-crafted presentation and it shows how many people stayed on to continue the conversation, just how great it was, a great way to end our brown bag series. So thank you so much. And it's been a pleasure working with you too as well. Um, thank you, thank you so you much. You're welcome. And to our audience, thank you so much for coming and uh, being with us. And we're glad we can give this platform and um, hopefully we'll we're able to uh, post it on our website so others can see because it, it really was a good presentation. So. <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, that concludes our uh, presentation. Everyone have a wonderful day. Stay safe and enjoy the rest of your semester. <laughs> And Dr. Edwards will stay on a little bit, okay? But everyone else is free to go. <laughs> everyone have a good one. <laughs> Bye, everyone.